Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. My name is John Nordlinger. I'm in Microsoft Research, and I'm very pleased to introduce Maggie Saif Al Nasser, who now is with Simon Fraser. Maggie comes from Northwestern. At both places, she's done a lot of innovative work with um, lighting, both in computer science and with theater, and she borrows from one to enhance the other. So hopefully, we'll all learn a little bit more about lighting here as well and become that much more enlightened. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't probably have to make that case that interactive entertainment is becoming a big and has a big impact on community. This is just pictures from the millions of people who were standing in line um, waiting for the Xbox 360 or PS3 and uh, robberies that were going on for the PS3 and the Wii's. Um, I think the point that I wanted to make was that the tools uh, for making these games are actually also very important because they not only make uh, games, but they also uh, find other places where you can use them for building training environments or educational environments. Um, when I started coding my first game, this is actually a screenshot, I think, from one of the uh, games that I coded. Um, code looked like this. Now students are using tools that, this is from Half-Life 2, uh, the hammer editor, where you can build behaviors and, build and, and script tr different uh, triggers to do different inter interesting things within the environments. So this is kind of like the argument of using assembly versus C-sharp to do exactly the same thing in a very fast and uh, effective way. Um, the tools also have some impact on literacy. Um, she said, uh, um, Justine Cassell says that video games provide an easy lead in to computer literacy. Um, judging from the high school uh, workshops that we've had, there's so many high school students who already started modding um, different game engines and they already learned uh, a lot of com valuable computer skills by themselves modding these environments. There is a number of books on modding for teens uh, that also are gaining popularity. Uh, we've done several workshops with middle school girls and high school girls and uh, where we had them uh, build their own games and I just chose several quotes from what they've said. Um, one of them said, I want to learn how to make an awesome video game. I would like to learn everything about technology or at least more than I did. And this was a girl that was afraid to, bre to break her computer by opening it up. Um, and this is another one who said, I want to, uh, to make my characters talk, build a world, and make interesting stories. So these tools are very important, not only because they facilitate the development of games, training environments, or other types of applications, but they also facilitate learning within middle school, high school ages, as well as the college level, and can facilitate creativity. Uh, so the two thrusts of my research, one of them is on building or enhancing uh, these tools, and the other one is on use of these tools in classrooms. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily on um, the, uh, the first thrust and um, maybe summarize some of the work that we did in the second thrust. Um, in the first thrust, my main focus is on looking at visual design tools. Um, and I build on cinematic and theatric theories. Um, and I use AI and computational intelligence because I come from Northwestern. Um, and the, the tools that I've built so far, uh, lighting primarily, um, and I've done some work in camera, character, and even um, physical performances like dance performances using some of the tools, uh, the engine tools. Um, all of the projects are in progress except the lighting, so the lighting is the most developed, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So why lighting? Because for me, really, lighting is everything. It is really how you see the world. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I come from 
BS in computer science. Uh, I directed in theater for two years. And I also did graphics design and advertisement for a year. Uh, I did my master's in computer science. And during my master's, I looked at psychology and neuroscience um, type of uh, models. And then I did my PhD in computer science at Northwestern. And during this time, I decided that psychology by itself was not enough to look at expressive uh, domains. And so I looked at acting and lighting design. And I spent a lot of time in acting classes and doing some lighting design for shows. Um, so during this time, there is, there is a number of books that talk about lighting. But it was really hard to understand what lighting really means unless you start building um, lighting characters and lighting people. Um, and so using that tacit knowledge, I've started to collect uh, an information about why lighting is important. Um, and I've identified several functions that lighting um, can be um, identified as one of the major um, uh, concepts. For example, Lighting can help in dramatic tension, uh, can help focus the audience on a specific point in time. Uh, and I actually used a uh, music video to draw this, because in, in uh, music videos, they can change the lighting from one place to another. And you can see the shift. Uh, and it's very primarily. And the dancer would go out and ch change her costumes and come back. And y y you wouldn't notice that she left because of the lighting, how the lighting changes. I cannot download that video, so I did not have the, that video to show. But um, uh, I can circulate it whenever you, uh, if you just send me an email. Um, lighting in traditional media is, is different. So lighting for the theater is very different than lighting from the film. Um, I've chosen some screenshots from, uh, this is some lighting design in theater, of course, uh, very exaggerated. And they use a lot of lighting for focus on characters because you're far away. While in film, they use a camera for focus, so they didn't have to use uh, lighting as much. But you can get film noir where you get a lot of shadows and a lot of dramatic intensity in lighting. Uh, and this is the Cook, the Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, which is a movie that used a lot of very exaggerated colors um, from scene to scene. Uh, currently, lighting design in, um, in games uh, have se several kind of uh, differences. So different games use different methods. One method is uh, primarily static lighting, where um, someone builds a level, and then someone else will come and put lights around and add detail to that uh, scene by uh, figuring out what the scene looks like. Well, there's a lamp here, and there's a lamp here, and I want to simulate that kind of environment. And um, uh, this particular scene uh, has speci a specific narrative behind it. So they basically manually build the lighting in the scene to convey that narrative, as well as convey uh, what the room should look like and how it's motivated by the current sources of light. Um, the advantage of that technique, uh, it's very static, so the designer has to know beforehand how things are. Um, it's ver very realistic, presents very realistic uh, uh, outcome because it's static, so I can, you can pre-render some of these effects. Uh, and it's very controllable uh, because the designer can go and do whatever they want beforehand. The problem is uh, this is an interactive environment, and so it's not dynamic. It does not change. Um, uh, this particular lighting setup would not change based on the interaction. They're not adaptable. So that's a big problem. So what they started doing is adding some dynamic to the static uh, by manually scripting some lighting effects and maybe adding some dynamic lights to the characters, uh, addressing some dy dynamic um, shadows and uh, some dynamic use of, uh, of lighting where, you, where the character can actually turn off lights. And I'm going to give you an example of this. This is Thief. So this is um, from Thief 3. If you haven't played the game, this, is, this shows you how visible you are. So when it's lit, that means you're very visible. And it's a stealth-based game, so you have to 
uh, hide behind shadows, right? So you have to create shadow areas for yourself and you have to hide. And you're a thief, so you have to steal stuff. So he turned off lights there so that so that he can use a shadow area and hide himself, right? So this is kind of a user controlled environment where you can change the lighting. Um, so stealth based games are excellent for um, you, uh, use of dynamic lighting. You have to use dynamic lights. Um, if you've um, seen, there is actually an interview by Warren Spector online that talks about lighting design within uh, this particular um, uh, Thief 3 and I think Thief 2 as well. Um, and because there is dynamic lights, and of course they had to have some static lights because um, you want to convey specific uh, in, uh, um, uh, um, kind of mood for the entire scene. So to create the right mood, artists want to go and, and put lights in specific places. So they augmented the static and the dynamic, but in order to make the dynamic workable, they had to redesign the environment uh, in, in a way that will allow you for places to create these shadows and then other places you can't. Um, so the design of the environment was very, very important for that particular game. So here are some of the advantages and, and uh, the disadvantages. Of course, it's controllable, adaptable, uh, and it does create some dynamic areas where the users can uh, create some shadow areas. Uh, but it's also restricted, and, it, uh, and um, it really depends on how well you can construct that level design to create these shadow pockets. Um, and the designer has to really think very, very hard on how you construct that level, how, where are the dynamic light areas, where are the static lighting areas, uh, and if any of the narrative changes, you're, you're out of luck. Another problem that I see with, with current lighting design is um, when you're building a lighting uh, for a show, a film, or a theater, uh, you usually look at the timing, right? Um, you can put users in a very con uh, saturated environment for, let's say, five minutes, and then we're going to go to a different scene, and, and we can uh, change the contrast, right? It'd be very saturated in one, and then we release the saturation in another, and so you get that curve of release attention and, and uh, rise of tension. And you can modulate that in a, in a film or a theater production because you know how the, the flow would go and the timing. And in games you don't have that because you can be stuck in that kind of level for hours. And I was stuck in Mission 21 in uh, Devil May Cry for hours. And that level of saturation is really, really bad, especially in a few, if you're in a very dark room. Um, and sometimes you can't really see anything afterwards. And uh, just to give you the level of saturation here is really, really high within that scene. And it's very obvious. Um, and if you play Le Devil May Cry, you could see that it begins with very low saturation, and then go to a different level with very high saturation, and then low saturation, high saturation. So there are that l uh, change in uh, saturation and tension levels in the scenes. Uh, but the timing is not correct, because the, the pacing and timing is really dependent on the user. So that's another problem. Um, one other problem that I've also seen with games is um, this particular game is, I think, in the 90s. And they, they, they thought about dynamic lighting, where uh, lights are all motivated by where torches are. And, you, and the user can actually take the torch and move it around. Some torches you could, and some torches you can't. Uh, so it created a really nice ambience for, for the, for the uh, mood, for the environment. But you get at problems like the last one that you didn't quite see. Um, right there. Oh. <sighs> okay, that's becoming more like a game now. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, in this particular uh, scene or this particular uh, point in the game, you are fighting that enemy. And um, because it's a 90s game, you kind of have to write uh, to uh, click on the right pixel, right, to, to hurt the enemy. And you can't quite see where the contours of that enemy is. And you can, I tried to kind of push him towards the light so that he'd be backlit and I could stab him. Uh, but sometimes he goes in that corner or that corner, which is really, really hard. Um, so playability-wise, mood-wise, it works. But for playability-wise, it was very, very hard. So why that happens? In uh, cinema or in film, when you're building a lighting for a scene, you're building it based on several concepts. Um, based on the narrative, based on the timing, the progression, uh, the physical configuration, where the camera is, where the characters are. Problem is, all of these really depend on the user in an interactive environment. Which means that you really need a dynamic system. Uh, and not just static plus dynamic or, uh, or a static system. So the goal is to basically build an adaptive lighting system, a dynamic lighting system, that will promote game, uh, better gameplay and also maybe in different interactive models. Uh, but that lighting also would need some control of the artist. So we need an authoring tool that will allow the, light, uh, the uh, artist to, uh, to build in their lighting effects. Um, and maybe that would create a better prototyping tool as well as a better way of exploring design at a much higher level than pointing, putting points of lights and, and um, doing a trial and error and see what, what works. Now the problem is developing that tool is hard uh, because uh, dynamic lighting technically is, uh, is very hard to create the right amount of details, the right amount of shadows and all of that that artists are used to do in Maya or 3D Studio Max. Uh, artists need some control, and as of yet, we don't know what the, really the, the language that's best suited for artists to do the lighting design work that they want. Um, most of, if you talk to any lighting designer and ask them, what do you want that interface to look like if you want to do something with the scene, they'll say, oh, I just want a button that says beautiful, and I'll just click it, and I do, uh, that's what I do. I, do the envi I make an the environment much more beautiful. Um, and uh, the, assuming that you do get a language that you can give the, the artist, uh, what your basic uh, challenge is then, how do we address that low-level control for the system? How do you create a system that will then adapt based on the context and based on that uh, input from the artist? So for my PhD, I built a system called L, which is an uh, expressive lighting engine. Um, it's an intelligent system that adjusts the lighting in real time while it tries to balance the effect that the artist um, tries to create as well as the context. It's all based on cinematic and theatric theory, but it's um, basically abstracted from my work in theater um, as a lighting designer and talking with lighting design. So it's, it's kind of the theory uh, that you see in books about lighting design as well as some tacit knowledge that I've collected through my experience. Um, and it does allow the artist to control, based on my experience, um, we build kind of a, a way for artists to say what the effect that they want is. Um, the system is, based, uh, is basically cons um, um, consists of three different subsystems. Um, a system that figures out where to place the lights, given a room or a level. Another system figures out how to angle these lights based on the influence of the uh, fixtures in, in the room or the nature of lighting that should be in that room, um, and the narrative as well as the context. Um, and a color subsystem that also tries to figure out what the colors of these different lights are. I'm going to go through some of these uh, just quickly to give you an idea. All of these are actually have mathematical equations behind them that uh, were developed based on the tacit knowledge and the cinematic theory. So in um, cinema or in uh, or theater, when you try to figure out where to place the lights, you try to figure it out for different, different uh, goals. Uh, you want to model the characters that are around, so if you have some characters in the scene or objects that you want to um, separate from the background, uh, that's what we mean by modeling. Uh, bring them out um, and separate them from the background, like this character, for example. You want to allocate lights for them. 
Um, then you want to create some depth in the scene. Then you want to uh, allocate lights in, in some parts of the room that, are, uh, that can create that gradient of depth. Um, you also look at visibility of different objects, uh, where you want to focus the lights on uh, the, of objects, and whether it's a, a very high key scene or a low key scene, which means contrast, basically. So I developed an equation that, uh, that uh, basically tries to evaluate, and there's your, your math a part of the lecture, right? Um, that tries to evaluate, given a specific setup, in a specific room, uh, what's the value of modeling, what's the value of depth, what's the value of visibility, and so forth, given that setup P. Um, and the artist would then control the weights here. So whatever is more important to him, that would be the highest weight, right? So you can configure um, um, a setup for a room based on what is the most important from an artistic point of view. So these are just two different uh, um, examples where I use the lighting system here and I use just ambient light there and the, um, the system was configured for higher depth so you can see some lights here and some lights there and a little lights there but it's not that much so it created some kind of depth. The angle subsystem uses, again, um, a cinematic theory, and it looks at uh, what, how would the artists actually uh, uh, angle these lights. And as it turns out, they angle the lights based on several things, again, visibility modeling, uh, but also where the lights are in the physical scene. So if you have light fixtures, then you want to motivate the angle based on these light fixtures. Uh, but not always. Some artists actually want to do that. Some artists don't. So these will also be weights that you're giving the lighting system. And again, another equation to figure out the best uh, angle given uh, the, uh, an evaluation of all of these different goals. I'm going to just show one particular goal, because that's, I think, important. Um, so the goal of figuring out the best visibility and motivation f uh, and modeling for a specific character um, is based on a theory, um, uh, actually it's techniques that were written by Millerson, where he had nine cases saying he, if the camera was, was pointed that way and then the characters pointed that way, uh, what is the good or bad positions for light for specific visi visibility and modeling? So this is kind of one that shows uh, character straight up to the camera. Uh, this is the character and the camera is looking up on the character. And these are good positions, these are bad forth. So um, as it turns out, if you look at all of these cases, we actually figure that they are a sine and cosine function of um, the angle from the camera to the light and the light to the subject. And that seemed to give us the best um, way to evaluate an angle of light towards the subject um, um, given that uh, the camera is facing a specific direction that the subject is facing. So these are just some images uh, where the, the, uh, um, the artists were able to, to uh, say how important visibility uh, and mood and contrast. Now, uh, mood was basically calculated as the um, uh, specific angle that they wanted. So for example, I want to create uh, a side lit character or a backlit character. So they will say, I want a backlit character and this is very important for me, so they give it a much bigger importance. Contrast is more like the low key, uh, high key, and it's really a contrast between the key light and the fill light. Uh, so in this particular uh, image, the contrast was low, the mood was low, there was no real angle that they wanted to create and the visibility was high, so the character's face is, should be much more visible. Uh, here they just uh, said they want the contrast to be higher, so you have more shadows in the character's face than here. Uh, and this one they said they wanted to have a side light angle, uh, and they want that to be very important, so, uh, and very high contrast, so you can see the character's face is, uh, is uh, side lit, Contrast is very high. 
And this one, the contrast is low, but it's still a uh, side-lit angle, so you, this fill and the key light are there, but you still get a lot of shadows on the center of the face. Um, similarly, the color system is the same. It's basically uh, figuring out what colors, and we're looking at hue, saturation, and lightness, or intensity. Um, and they are based on similar goals. What do you want to create in the scene? And uh, they identify depth, dramatic intensity, um, uh, the, the high key versus low key. Um, but also, uh, some, some artists wanted to create more uh, or wanted more control on the color. So they wanted to uh, uh, have some control on how the hue and the saturation, if you want high saturation in the image or low saturation. Um, and some palettes, so some of them said, I don't want the reds to be too much, or I don't want the blues to be too much. So there are some palette restrictions as well. So we added that all up, and we have some more math um, that will basically figure out what is the color given a previous color. So you want to maintain visual continuity in the scene, right? So uh, the color of a specific uh, light ver based on the colors of other lights in the areas. Um, and uh, based on the specific constraints, the palette restrictions, as well as the color constraints. Now, the color is actually not for each, uh, it's not calculated for each light. It's calculated for each area, so that makes the search space much smaller. And the areas are identified basically using theatric techniques. And theater basically says you have uh, acting areas where the actors are, uh, and you have non-actor areas, which is like the non-focus part of the scene, and you have background. Um, and so you have three types of areas, the focus area, the, where the ca actors are, and the non-acting areas, where the non-focus is, and the, the background. And this eye here is basically calculating color for each one of these areas. And these are just uh, uh, constraints on the color. Uh, the saturation, the hue, the lightness, and the warmth. Now, warmth is an important thing because it's perceptual. Uh, and we did track down an unpublished paper on uh, how people actually think about warm versus cool colors. And what they did was they uh, asked people to rate warm and cool, and they plotted it into a graph. And as it turns out, this graph is uh, we, we actually basically figured out an equation, a linear equation, uh, by doing um, uh, a reg linear regression in that particular curve within the RGB space. So we wanted to figure out, given um, an RGB color, what is the warmth value for that color, right? And that gives you that particular uh, warmth. Now, orange is much warmer than red, as we found out, or uh, perceptually at least. Um, so, again, these are just uh, uh, images that show if the artist says lightness is important, I want, to, uh, I want the lightness to be uh, much higher. Uh, contrast, I want it to be like 50%. Warmth, I want it to be really high. So this is more orangey and um, uh, the contrast is much lower than So for this one, they want the warmth lower, right? So you have uh, much cooler uh, backgrounds. Here, the warmth is higher, but the contrast is much higher, and the lightness is lower. So uh, the lightness here is in terms of the background, so the background is much uh, less in terms of intensity. Uh, the contrast is high, so the contrast is between the character or the focus area and the non-focus area. So you can bring the character out basically, using that technique. And you want warm colors in the environment, so it still becomes orangey. So um, these are basically, again, the goals. Um, why would that be useful? Again, it, will be, it is a dynamic system that allows designers to actually figure out how to design the scene in a much higher level. Um, and we're hoping that it would make also a different a difference in terms of how you design for a game. Uh, I'm going to show you two um, different demos that I've uh, shown at Kai in the Interactivity uh, 2005, I think, venue. Uh, what we did was we had people actually play 
um, a first-person shooter with the lighting system and without the lighting system. And the one with the lighting system was authored by my graduate student, who uh, is a sound designer in theater, and he actually we turned him into a lighting designer. Um, and so he wanted to have a narrative for the light. And what he wanted to do is whenever tension becomes really high, he, he uh, places more um, emphasis on saturation of red colors. So you know that you're in a very high tension scene when you see the, re uh, the, the colors of the scene becomes much more red. And tension there was uh, associated with how many monsters and how much health you have. Um, so this is the first person shooter with the lighting system. So the lighting here is all done using L. There is nothing that he had to put lights for. He just said, I want a high contrast in the beginning, low contrast, and then very high saturated red colors when monsters are around. And of course, he just gave you a shield gun. <laughs> Um, well, the, this was using Unreal Tournament, so we didn't really do anything with shadows. This was all textures and, um, uh, and lighting colors. Uh, but if you can see, the lighting on the characters are different from the lighting in the environment to emphasize them so you can actually see them more clearly. So you have um, a warmer, which is uh, an orange color on, on the character's face to bring them out. So the lighting system was trying to work out, given what the lighting in the environment is, how to light the characters, how to bring them out, modeling should be high. Um, I'm detecting concentrated photon activity, probably a hologram. Watch yourself. One of the rocks down there might want your spleen as a trophy. And that was all my, my, actually my graduate student's voice. He changed his voice based on, uh, he's, a light, he's a sound designer, so he can do that. So you notice the environment here is green, that just signifies that you just got more health, right? So there's nothing in here, we removed the HUD, we removed everything from the Unreal, so there's nothing that gives you information about health or, um, yeah, in this particular room you have a lot of enemies. But you can see that the saturation goes lower as, you, as much, uh, when you kill any of the enemies it goes lower. Okay, so I'm going to show you the one without the lighting system. Now, we, we chose to use the same sounds, right? So you will see the same sounds. Um. Mission complete. There's too much interference to pinpoint hostile locations, so watch yourself. That gear you're wearing is too new to lose already. We've got some friendlies down there as well, so don't go shooting any. Otherwise, follow your mission briefing, and good luck. Now we get more detail because this is all static li uh, lit by the, by the graduate student again. He just put lights around in the environment. Um, now this is not dynamic lighting, so it doesn't change colors. Um, it would not change emphasis. or uh, It's very, very much static. Okay, so when we showed it to, uh, at Kai to people, we had a lot of people come and play both of them. Uh, and some of them were uh, gamers, some of them weren't, and some of them were actually uh, 
uh, great Unreal Tournament fans and some of them weren't. The non-gamers really liked it because they felt that they ha were more involved, uh, they can understand the visual representation, or can understand much more information from the environment rather than from these uh, small detailed knobs. Um, and uh, so a lot of them said that they get some information through the environment. Um, some of the gamers said that it made the game too easy for them because once there is a monster laying around somewhere, uh, the, the environment is still red, right? So you know that there is something around. Um, and some said that the lighting was disturbing to them. They not used to, um, and of course some of them com were complaining that they only had the shield gun, uh, but that was beside the fact. Um, so it, it's an interesting that uh, how the, the gamers versus non-gamers and familiarity with the environment was uh, had some maybe negative and some positive aspects to it. Um, we another idea that we were looking at is how so uh, how to adapt using the visual focus component of lighting. Uh, if you look at uh, the reason why I don't play first person shooters is I, I die a lot and I die a lot because I don't, I don't have time to actually see where the, ca uh, the enemies are uh, coming from before they kill me. Um, and so we were thinking well maybe if we emphasize the characters more then people will, will tend to see them um, uh, much, much quicker and then maybe kill them, right? Uh, so we did some eye tracking experiments to see if this is uh, if you actually can notice the characters much quicker, and they do. Uh, they still get killed, but they they do uh, spend a lot more time in the environment before they die. Uh, so we were thinking maybe we can do an adaptive visual focus uh, here, where we can emphasize a character more and then move that emphasis uh, in time depending on how well they are doing. So using the lighting in a different way. Um, now we also used it in classrooms, uh, or actually before we did use it in classrooms, I'm actually going to show you a demo of what we're doing now. Um, and we showed that in Midway, which is why it's called the Midway demo. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this was done using the C4 engine, and the idea behind it was instead of uh, the problem with lighting uh, or with L uh, as a current system that I've seen with uh, using it in classrooms was too many uh, numerical constraints, and they were all dependent. But a lot of people did not understand how to tweak them, and so we were thinking maybe if uh, if we did it like lighting designers do it, where uh, I basically base my lighting design based on images. So uh, this image creates specific aesthetic, and I like that aesthetic, and I want to recreate it in the scene. So we're thinking of changing the interface for L, where we give it uh, images as an, a way of saying, here's the aesthetic that we want in the scene, and having that aesthetic replicate in the 3D environment. And so this is m the current uh, prototype, where we just looked at color. Um, and I'm going to actually run it real time here. And it's all using the, the C4 engine. So this is a basic environment in C4 that we've uh, used. And if you go to F1, you can basically get any image. Um, it does not have to be from that list. You can get any image into that environment. It can be abstract or, or uh, non-abstract. And so if, if I use this image, say OK. It takes a long time to compute, but here you go. Now, so once you get the particular image, you can also change the effect of that image. So uh, what this algorithm does is figures out col uh, um, clusters of colors within the image. And then we'll try to match them into the 3D environment based on where the, the lights are. Uh, so sometimes the, what you see in the image is a specific cluster because it's focused in a specific way. So we, what we did was we had a, a design kind of galleries approach where you uh, look at a specific clusters and then you go into different uh, kind of branches from that effect. So this is the, uh, the choices that an artist would have. 
And then he can say set the ambient light using that choice. And set the ambient light, what we would do is basically use a perceptual algorithm to set the right ambient given the environment. And what you can still do further is it will show where the lights are. And you can click on any one of these lights. And you can still manipulate the RGB components for that light and the warmth as well. So this is kind of like our first prototype to see how uh, the things go. And then we showed it at Midway. And um, uh, they, uh, they were really impressed with it. And they said, well, can we, in part of their process, they do paint overs. So uh, a, a person would actually take the, 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 um, a per specific perspective from a level design. And then they paint over it specific lighting effects that they want. Um, and then somebody else will take that paint over and, and replicate it in a 3D scene. And so what they were thinking, if that can get, uh, get us maybe 50% from the paint over to the 3D scene, and then we can tweak afterwards, that would, would uh, actually be very cost effective for them. So that's one of the projects that we are uh, working with them on once they figure out all the, p the legal paperwork, of course, which is another completely different question. All these projects always get stuck in the legal paperwork. But um, so another thing that we were thinking about, too, is in games like The Sims or the movies, um, where you have this specific scene, you build all, uh, your entire scene in movies, right? So you have a script, and you have a, a plot, and, and you have cut scenes, and, um, and other kinds of effects. But in terms of lighting, this is all you get, right? Uh, so it would be really nice to have that lighting system in, embedded within their tools. Um, and some people have actually suggested that this would be a really good way of promoting some media literacy to many of the people. So uh, then my second part, my second thrust, is to use these tools with game engines and classes. And I've used them in some classes. I've used them in the interactive narrative class at Northwestern. And I'm actually going to show a demo from that class because it's just a really interesting demo that they created. Uh, their I the idea was to use Greek tragedy um, as a constraint for them to build a game around. And uh, they were given the lighting tools. They were given a story tool that I've created uh, and, uh, on top of another game engine. And uh, one of the groups have created this particular game which I think is a very cool idea.
Okay, so that was uh, one of the um, class projects. The idea there was we were wanting, we want them to do something with interactive narrative, and so they uh, they chose sports. But how do you get sports to more to Greek tragedy and the narrative in Greek tragedy? So we try to characterize the characters, right? The characters would be the ones that carry the narrative. Um, and you still, it's very highly stylized, as you could tell. Uh, I've also used it in Penn State when I, when I taught my game design courses, and I did use L uh, a lot on top of Unreal Engine, which is that's kind of the interface for L on top of Unreal. Um, and they did very highly stylized games as well. Um, one of the courses we actually did take them to the uh, opera in a field trip to uh, understand the role of set design and lighting and mise en scene um, and then try to replicate it. So these are the difference between their projects in terms of the lighting aspects in their projects and understanding of lightings between prototypes. Um, so in the future what I want to do is basically attack that problem of shadows because uh, shadows are very important and are very important visual cues. Um, so add on lighting, looking at shadow, dynamic shadows um, and looking at uh, dynamic texturings because we didn't do some of that. Uh, we did some, but not with materials and, and other things. Um, uh, we're also looking for industry partners to kind of try out the different lighting design uh, or the different systems that we have uh, and continue in other projects like the character and the camera project and the dance project where we're actually taking that lighting system and putting it in physical space so that dancers can move in the space uh, and use this, the, the lighting in the environment as an expressive uh, part of their body, kind of an extension within the environment. Um, so that's one of the projects that we're doing at Simon Fraser. Um, we looked at Second Life and we were using um, Second Life gestures and character techniques for uh, training actors, uh, which is a very challenging, especially when we have, uh, uh, we're looking at mask-based acting, which is Commedia dell'arte. Uh, and one of our peop the people who are collaborating in that project is actually from Italy. His, uh, his great-great-grandfather was the founder of Commedia dell'arte from, from um, Italy. Uh, we also looked at visual, uh, visual design from, uh, for uh, Lockheed Martin project with, uh, called The Living Hypothesis, and I think that's as much as I can say about that project, um, just because of the secrets and the IP issues. Um, but so the, um, for, for the direction in, the tw in terms of using the tools and the game engines in classrooms, I'd like to look into more using that research tools in the classrooms and evaluating it a bit more and see what the impacts are uh, of these research tools. Uh, especially we're looking at uh, modding as an environment. Um, this is just games from the uh, Gaming for Girls that we've run in middle school and high school at Penn State. Um, and uh, these are actually environments that the, the girls have created using different modding tools. And we're looking at adding more of the character tools and lighting tools and the camera tools into that because they've had a lot of different problems with the, especially with the camera, how to uh, put the camera in the right place while they're telling the stories because they really want to tell the stories and not really worry about the camera and the lighting. So in conclusion, uh, indus game industry is growing and what's more important, at least for me, is really how the tools impact the development of other applications and how do we use, re how do do research to enhance these tools and how to uh, evaluate these, the impact of um, this research on the education side as well as um, the use of its applications in ther health therapy, education and training. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Questions? Mm -hmm. So does your system uh, take as input the location of all the lights initially, or does it actually propose lighting locations? Uh, so the question was, uh, does it really um, uh, figure out, like, the li does the designer actually give it where the lights are and then it uses that. Uh, this, the system originally, no, it actually figures out where to place the lights. So it just gets a scene graph and figures out from there and where the characters are. Um, and you have to update it where the characters are all the time because it's all changing in real time. And it figures out from there where to place the lights. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So one of, one of the uh, one of the factors that you were talking about in uh, in your value function was was context, and you gave a couple of examples like you know am I in danger? Um, what are what are some of the some of the interesting aspects of, of context that, uh, that that you that you that you use? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, the question is about context and uh, what kind of context do we have beyond the, just the danger um, aspect. Well, I originally designed that particular lighting system within an interactive narrative uh, where uh, these particular characters are actually from the interactive narrative that I've designed it for. And so parts of the context, uh, uh, the context were um, emotional relationships between the different characters. So that was taken into account to figure out, should I underlight the character, should I uh, emphasize the character right now and, or not? Um, we've played around with several uh, other games like uh, um, uh, the thief type games. Uh, and there the context would be, uh, 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 basically more physical where the characters are in relation to you because you are uh, you are a thief basically so the lighting would be very different um, so we have not formalized the model for figuring out what is the context for any of the games and I don't think there would be like a general context formula uh, but I think the context can be defined and then you could just use rules to figure out how to trigger based on context Mm -hmm. Is any of your stuff available on the web to download and try out? Um, is anything available on the web? Um, the not right now. Uh, uh, the, the demos are, uh, but it's not interactive demos. Um, we could make the, de the midway demo available for like an executable for you to try out, um, but we will just do it by uh, email rather than putting it on the web. Mm -hmm. When did the girl that did tragedy kind of go? Well, it wasn't from the gaming progress. Actually, it was a Northwestern class. It was uh -huh. an, an interactive narrative in Northwestern, and that was three guys. Oh. Um, and they are basically film people, and I'm not sure where they went. They probably went film somewhere or waiter or waitresses. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you.